Ireland they can do that. If you are an English couple and you go to England and you're born the baby there, that baby got to come back and live for 10 years before that baby is even accepted. Because when you are small island people, you got to preserve your identity. Of course. And you can't open up to the invasion of the rest of the world. You have been invaded. Your, your island has been invaded by the rest of the world. And you have no defenses. Because I remember when I came back here from England, I used to come to St. Martin every weekend because Angola was so uninteresting and dead. I would come to St. Martin and spend my weekends with my family in Agrama and so forth. And there came a time when the French was coming in from Guadeloupe and Martinique, the gendarmes, the immigration officers, and they were driving out the poor St. Lucian, the Dominican, who was renting the little shacks that my family were renting for them and so on. And I told my family, don't celebrate this. Don't you celebrate this because the French is preparing for themselves. I said they are preparing for themselves. And when the French comes, they're not going to rent your shacks. They're going to build their own. Some of them came with papers, 500, 600 years, their great-grandparents <laughs> had communal land and the country the land. They took your land from you and all of that. And you know, there was no any strength of law. There was no law as such in St. Martin. It was like a, a, a banana republic. You can shoot and kill, and there was nothing for it, and so forth. Because the French did not want that to happen. But you think that France itself was a lawless country. This was not so. They deliberately created those conditions there. And today, what you have? You go just across the home in twos. On the other side there, what you see? How many St. Martiners have a business down there? <laughs> Tell me. You go to the East Coast. And when you talk about tourism, they never really genuinely wanted the tourism industry on this side. Because in the other days of tourism, coming to St. Martin, tourism was on the Dutch side. And French St. Martiners had to go to the Dutch side of St. Martin to get a job. Because if you talk about an alien land holding policy, the French has the most strict alien land holding policy. They do not allow anybody, any American, anybody else to come and take their lands from them. Everything must belong to them, it must be French. The currency, the banking system, everything else was so strictly French. France is a nationalistic society. They are nationalistic. And you are supposed to be equally nationalistic. You, you, you look at what happened in the Francophone states. General de Gaulle was voted as the president of France because he was a military genius. And the people felt that he's the man who will settle the Algerian war. And General Gaulle looked at the military situation and said, Algeria is a large country and they're fighting a guerrilla war. We cannot beat them militarily. What we are going to do, we're going to do a diplomatic stunt. We're going to give them independence, but we see them benefit. And France benefited much more by giving Algeria its independence. Where does the resources of Algeria go? It's pumped into France. And yet Algeria has its own problems. France owned Indochina. And she had to be beaten out of Indochina. She never wanted to leave the Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh Trail in Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. All these countries were colonized by France and she had to be beaten out. In many of the African states, she created wars and she was able to dominate the situation. And that's the French. When Secretary of Guinea decided to take one of the options for independence, because General de Gaulle offered them three, three options. You either become part of the Commonwealth of France, you take complete independence, or you stay as you are. Secretary was the only African leader who said he would take independence. And when he decided to take independence, the French cut off all aid to Guinea. All aid. He went to Poland, Eastern Europe, and they gave him money. And when the French saw the Eastern Europeans were giving them money, they went back and said, okay, okay, we'll give you. 
and start giving them aid in, in every other state, including Madagascar. Every other state in West Africa. So all right, you want independence too. So that's how you have the, 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 the problems in, 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 in French Africa now being solved by independence. But France maintains a grip on the economies. And every time they step out the line, you know the French going in. Whether in Northern Mali or wherever they go, they're going to get in there. All right? So this question of overseas department, that's assimilation leads to annihilation. Because as a people, you are completely annihilated. As a people, you have nothing. They tell you about the social welfare state, the social welfare system. That, that turns you into what? Drug addicts? Where the jobs? Where the jobs in the hotels? The hotels were always intended to actually accommodate the movement of the French people into St. Martin, in this tropical paradise. Yeah. If you live in any of the European cities, you know, there's so much stress. Nobody smiles. <laughs> Everybody's in stress. The climatic conditions is one thing. The other threats to their society is another thing. And the social welfare system will one day disappear under pressure. Because even in England now, the present Prime Minister Cameron is saying that if he comes back to power, he is going to, he is going to take it away from anybody over 23. Nobody will get. Right now, people are suffering. People are sleeping on the streets in England because the social welfare system has been impaired. So what we are trading on right now is a social welfare system, which means that a girl can make 20 children and lose her. Lose her, her. A dignity, mm -hmm. all right, and the French is going to pay so much for each child and so forth and so on. But what happens to her? The young man will get some sort of help until they can't help you anymore, and then what happens to you? But that process, you are already captured and conquered. So you have a big fight on your hands to fight back because if your leaders were vigilant in the early days and were nationalistic, they would have prevent. Prevention is always better than cure. Now, in Angola, you should learn a lot the battle that we have to fight in Angola. I have to fight every day in Angola. There was a buccaneer governor there for four years. And of course, he was supposed to be the foreign government office. And uh, I had to fight him. And I told him, I, I will take one chapter of the church's book. I'll fight. And then I will surrender. <laughs> so, he fought. He was supposed to get rid of Hubert Hughes before he left Angola, but I got rid of him. <laughs> when they wrote me, and they told me, and they wrote me and told me that um, they're about to change the governor, what type of what qualities are like in the new governor. I took about four or five months before I answered them. <laughs> and when I did answer, I said, I, I know you're not serious, but yeah, I'll tell you what I don't want. I don't want a governor that last one. I don't want a governor from the foreign office because he's a diplomat and comes with the same colonial mentality. I don't want a governor who don't believe in God. How you can tell me the queen is the friend of the faith and your son of governors here don't believe in God? Right? I want a government who's going to walk with the elected representatives of the people. And you know what? They gave me a young woman. They gave me a young woman, and my opponents and brother say, they send me Hubert a woman because no Hubert like women. <laughs> they gave me a young woman that comes and she wants us to go dancing and other things. <laughs> But I told her she's a diplomat still, because although she did not come from the diplomatic wing of the British government, because you know, when Britain had an empire, she had three ministries representing overseas countries. She has the foreign, the foreign ministry, that deal with foreign countries. She had the Commonwealth minister deal with independent countries of the British Commonwealth. 
like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, and the likes. And then she had the colonial minister, colonial section, who dealt with the vast empire. In that time, she had Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, Northern Rhodesia, <coughs> Southern Rhodesia, Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, and the rest of them, Tanganyika, and so forth and so on. So the fact is that there were three. Now they have one ministry, and they call it the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But it's still diplomatic. It's still all about diplomacy. And if I am a British colony, how are you going to tell me you are my administrator? Yeah. We, we check it out. Huh? Yeah, you're doing well with okay. yeah. <laughs> how, how are you responsible for my administration? And yet, you establish an embassy. An embassy is a, is a, is a foreign representation in another country. And that's, that's the basis of which they try to operate. But the question of nationalism must be embedded in your movement. You must be nationalistic. And to be nationalistic, obviously, they're going to say it's racism. But what is the St. Martin? The St. Martin is Afrocentric. The majority of St. Martin, St. Martin comes from Africa. They, um, some are talking about the Amelia Wilson Park, but remember in the old days when slaves used to escape from Angola, they used to go in the cave over there. They, they, they actually built a compartment in that, in that, in that mountain. So St. Martin and Angola has always been one people. But when the European came, they were separating us. The governor wants to come and talk to the super fair. <laughs> He don't want, you know, and they have their own interests. They don't have our interests. I could have had a lot of development from Guadalupe. I could have had an, a water line, an electric line from EDF on the French side to Angola, which would have solved my water problems and my electrical problems. But the British started it. I could have had an airport from the Chamber of Commerce in Point of Peak and a seaport development. But the British started saying, those are areas that British investors can put their money in, because we are British. But I tell them, you can't stop that again, because I'm ready to fight them tooth and nail wherever I go. But the fact is that the British islands, because Britain had more than she can chew, gave us an opportunity to have a semblance of democracy. Because if you look at the British island, St. Kitts, a small island like St. Kitts, opting for independence. And I remember when I went to school in St. Kitts, they didn't have a graduate teacher in the grammar school who was a Kittisha, because St. Kitts were kept down. All the teachers come from elsewhere. And today, now that St. Kitts is independent, St. Kitts can export university graduates. Now, when, in those days, no land was owned by the kids, and no matter how respectable you may be, you could not buy a piece of land because the estates were owned by a few English people, all the estates. So you couldn't buy land. Today, with Bracha taking over all the lands in kids, every kitchen can have a piece of land and a house. Sinkers have some of the best housing now in the Eastern Caribbean because of the fact that they have the independence. Of course, that they, they're messing it up nowadays because they're selling citizenship and all that type of thing for money. And it's the money factor that destroyed us as a black people. In all these territories, um, people use money to humiliate us and destroy us. Because I remember some time ago when I entered politics and well, some of the people who used to live in St. Martin came to me and said, well, you know, you have to pay me for my vote. So I said, look, let me tell you something. I've never been to bed with a prostitute yet. So paying somebody for a vote is like prostitution. I said, so I said, I come to represent you. I consider myself as a political missionary. I squander a lot to be here. I had a good life in England. And I come to represent you. You're telling me I must pay you for a vote? Martin Luther King died fighting for the rights of black people to vote. How many hundreds of thousands of people died in Africa fighting for the right to vote? In South Africa, 
a Zimbabwe farmer, son Rhodesia in Kenya. Mama, the um, Joma Kenyatta went to jail for something like 11 years, nine years, because he was accused of leading Mama, who was African liberation fighters in Kenya. So many of our leaders were fighting for nationalism, the principle of nationalism, went to jail. Every African leader, Kwame Nkuma in Ghana, which was founded the Gulf Coast, he went to jail when he came out, 1957, he came out of jail, won the elections, and eventually became right. the first independent state of West Africa. And he then started to indoctrinate a lot of the other states. Nigeria, which is much bigger, went long after him. So you find that um, the colonial powers were ready to put you in jail if you are nationalistic. But this is what you face here. You face a lot of recrimination in this island as a group because you are challenging something which they have created and which they want to maintain. And you've got to fight very hard. You've got to carry this throughout the length and breadth of this island. And we have to work together so that Anguilla, St. Martin, St. Mate can also be in this struggle together. As far as I'm concerned, um, you are right. You have all these guests here. So many other islanders have benefited from the economy in St. Martin. And St. Martin has not been reciprocal in that regard because you have not benefited from them. The time has come for you to say to them, you have to recognize what you got from us and now share your country with us as well. So this movement must move inwards and outwards so that it can get gain strength because you are fighting from a very, very um, difficult position. You're fighting something that's a monster mm -hmm. that's already been established and you have not established the nationalistic cards to assist you. For instance, in a place like Ducson Market, I advocated them many years ago that they should establish a national bank so that natives of St. Martin mm -hmm. can borrow money and go into the business right. and don't allow the business sector to be taken over by the Asians. But they didn't do that. They did not a genuine national development bank where the natives could get money to go into business. Because you cannot compete. That's a defiscalization de system which they use. What did they do? It facilitated metropolitans to take over St. Martin, the business sector of St. Martin. That's all it did. Because you know how much land has been reclaimed in Marigold. But when you walk through that reclamation area, you realize you're back in, south, in the south of France. <laughs> That's what it is. You know? So wherever part of the development of St. Martin is all for the <laughs> metropolitan French. So you have a big fight on your hands. It's not easy. It's not easy at all because you've already been overrun. Sorry to be so long, but you know, okay. I can go on and on. I see that everybody already give Mr. Hughes a standing ovation. And uh, I mean, what Mr. Hughes have said, it puts you back in to think when you're listening to our program, our grassroots program. Because those are the issues that we champion all the time. And I just know that hearing this, you could pass it on to your friends that haven't been able to make it here today. And say that what you heard Mr. Hughes said is what the grass has been preaching. And we are way behind some of understanding that we are in danger. Okay? Yeah. It's time for some people to realize that we are in danger. And this fight, it's like fighting uh, a two round fight, because I'm boxing and I'm going to refer to that line. When we fight in a 12 round fight, we already lose uh, 11 round already. That's what we need. We need a knockout. <laughs> we can't win by decision because we need a knockout. And, and we, we have to put that mindset in our head. We can't go jamming and moving again. We need a, we need a right or a pocket or a left foot. That's all we can do. We can't, we can't do it with a jab. We can't do it with a jab. Okay? Anyhow, anyway, I'd like to thank Mr. Lewis for being a true friend of the people of St. Martin. And we love you for that because now that most of you 
know that Mr. Hughes not only an Anglian, but go back to the tradition days, he come back with my grandmother. And what we always say, wherever you have, whenever you can reclaim or link your root to St. Martin, you are a grassroots St. Martin. And Mr. Hughes is a grassroots St. Martin. So we're not saying the Angola, we're not saying the Angola uh, Chief Minister, we're saying the St. Martin Angola Chief Minister. Yes. <laughs> okay, so they ain't got something to do with the Angola root. Okay? Again, we thank you, thank you, thank you, folks. Now I would like to also to recognize and introduce to you our ID card committee members. And starting with Ms. Daniela Jeffrey. Okay, and then we got Seth Nicello is a Borash White. Okay, so I got uh, Ms. Daniela and Oras White. We got X-ray. Dr. Scott had to leave, so there's some kind of duty to call. Couldn't stay, but Mr. Mr. Uh, Dr. Scott was here a while ago. And he left, uh, so we got uh, yeah, Mr. Scott, we got Patrick Ellis, he didn't make it today. Patrick Ellis, not Patrick Ellis, it's Patrick. Andre Patrick. Andre Patrick, Andre Patrick, I see Patrick. <laughs> I'm so used to saying, you know, but I see Patrick and I add the rest of it. Patrick Ellis is one kind of right. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get too much in the media. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hey, that's the whole family, just put Patrick. Put <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, it tells you. Uh, I like in that. And we have a Dr. James, Dr. Leopold James, and myself, Jesse, as the members of the committee for that. Okay, and uh, we got here now. And finally, on behalf of the IDCAP committee, my privilege to present you and complete. Yes. Yes, I'm going to give you Freddie Richardson. Huh? Excuse me. 